Good morning. Thank you to Donna and Anne-Marie and the rest of those ladies. Their story is a powerful one, is it not? Yeah, thank you for sharing with us. So uh, I remember hearing a story being told to me about um, a young couple. And they were expecting their second child. Their first one had come uh, about three years previous, and uh, he was a little bit of a handful. And, uh, but he was really talkative and uh, seemingly bright. And so the expectations were really high for their second child. And there was a miscarriage in between, and this baby seemed to be moving just a little bit less. And so maybe a little bit of apprehension went along uh, with that excitement as any pregnancy brings. But doctors really just said, listen, I, everything's going to be everything's going to be fine. Um, mom really didn't do well with labor the first time around, so a C-section date was scheduled, and everyone planned for this new baby to come into the world. If you know uh, a little bit of what I'm talking about, if you've ever, you know, been a parent, you know that there's so much expectation that comes with a pregnancy, that comes with a birth, that comes with new life. And so um, mom and dad were in the delivery room, and the doctors and the nurses were getting everything together, and there was laughter, and there was joking, and there was anticipation, and um, it was just uh, that, just that normal scene that you would see all the time in those places. But as it came for uh, this child to be born, those, those smiles and those jokes changed to looks of concern. And that feeling of expectation turned into fear. And these moments that, um, that were full of such hope had been turned on end. You see, this baby um, had been born, but um, he was blue, and pale, and limp. He, he didn't have a lot of muscle tone. In fact, uh, he couldn't eat. He had to have a tube inserted into his nose, and he was rushed very quickly out of the room with no time to answer these young parents' terrifying questions. So he spent some time in the NICU, and uh, the doctors spent uh, days and hours trying to figure out how did this happen? How do we miss this? What's going on? And so they thought, you know, um, this clearly is from birth, so maybe there's something Maybe there's something congenital going on. Maybe there's, maybe there's something uh, genetic. So maybe we should, you know, test, test mom out and see what's going on there. And so uh, this, this young father and this young mother um, had to go for various different tests and ended up one day in a neurologist's office where the mom uh, was stuck with a couple of electrodes, one uh, close to her wrist and the other one up near her elbow. And there was an intern working with the doctor that day, as usually happens, as people are trained in medicine. And uh, suddenly, almost shockingly, this doctor said to the internist, look, 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 there it is. That's what we're looking for. That, that oscillating sound, that that's it. And of course, um, this mother and father, husband and wife, had no idea what what the doctor was talking about. And so um, he turned to them and said, I I'm sorry, but um, your wife, your wife has a form of muscular dystrophy. And so does your young son as well. And it's incurable. And it's degenerative. And it's lifelong. In that moment, all those expectations, all those promises, all those plans, all those dreams for that young mom and her infant son and their family together turned upside down and turned into disappointment. I remember uh, talking with this father years later. 
years later, a very long time after the birth of his son, and he just so vividly described the walk that he took that day. He just needed to get out of the hospital and get some air and figure out what, what was going on. This is not what I expected. This is not what I thought our lives were going to be. God, where, where are you in this moment? And tears filled his eyes. See, he remembered just crying out into the night sky. Feeling so disappointed. There's another story of a walk that uh, I think has some distinct similarities to this one. Maybe this is a story that you've heard about. A couple friends were, uh, were leaving the big city. Uh, they had gone there to celebrate um, with their family and with their friends. And um, it was a big holiday. And they're on their way uh, home back to the countryside. And while they were in the big city uh, for this holiday, um, there was a lot of excitement. There was um, just a buzz about this city, and there was something in the air, like something was going to happen. Like there was so much promise. People were on the edge of their seat. You see, these, these two friends, they, um, years earlier, they, they had decided to follow uh, someone, someone who... Uh, who was a great teacher, uh, even a, a miracle worker. Some even said he was a prophet. And so there was big plans, man. Big plans. Big plans. And yet, um, a week that started with celebration ended with betrayal. And it ended with their leader being captured being wrongly accused and tried, being beaten, being tortured, being murdered, and being buried. And this was not part of the plan. This was not part of God's plan. And here they go walking away They've heard these stories from their friends, like somehow the place where they put the body was empty now. And there were some of their friends who were women who were telling stories they just couldn't even believe. And uh, these two companions walked, trying to figure life out. And so this, uh, this traveler uh, comes up alongside them and, uh, you know, just kind of almost out of the blue, and says to them like an unthinkable question. He says, hey, what's going on, guys? What's happening? And they just stop. And their faces fill with sorrow and almost anger. And they respond like, where have you been, dude? Don't you even know what's going on? Haven't you heard of Jesus? No, the man says. Uh, why don't you, why don't you tell me what's, what happened? And so they share the story. They say, you know, Jesus, he was this great teacher, and he was this prophet, and he did great things among all the people. And then our leaders, the political and the religious leaders, they just put him to death. We thought, we hoped we expected that he would be the one to rescue Israel. He would be the one. He was the Messiah we were waiting for. And this, this traveler turns to them and says something pretty, pretty blunt and unexpected. And in the Steve Hoadley paraphrased Greek translation, it says, you guys are stupid. No, I'm serious. You're, you're, you're dumb. Don't you get it? 
And he spends the next moments, he says, look at these scriptures. You say you follow these teachings. You say you understand what God has said. You, don't you understand? This is the way it was supposed to go. This is the way that it was supposed to go. This is God's plan. And so he looks like he's going to keep on going, and uh, they say, wait a second, this guy knows something. We've got to sit down and talk more about this, right? Why don't you come and stay? Come and stay. Have supper. It's, it's late. So they sit down together, and this traveler blesses the meal, and he breaks the bread. And at that instant, these friends, these companions, these followers of Jesus, they recognize it's him. It's him. And he vanishes from their sight. They say, we just saw Jesus. We just saw Jesus. He, he was here. Jesus was here. We just saw him. We got to go. We got to go tell our friends back in the big city of Jerusalem that he's alive. Jesus is alive. We thought that our disappointment was going to reign in our hearts, but no. There's something more. There's something more to this story. See, Jesus, Jesus flips the script. Jesus flips the script. That's what he does. He takes our stories and he changes them. And he shows us what life is all about. You see, these followers of Christ, they had, they had their own ideas, their own expectations, their own plan for what Jesus' rule and reign would actually look like. But God had other plans. Has anyone ever been in this place before? Not this church. I didn't mean that. It was a metaphorical statement. That place of disappointment? That place, see, what, what is disappointment? Disappointment is when life doesn't go the way you expect it, right? Disappointment is a human condition. Every single person experiences disappointment. If you haven't experienced disappointment yet, you just haven't lived long enough. It might look like um, a promotion. A promotion that you know that you were due, but it slipped through your fingers somehow. And you're disappointed. It may have been the love of your life. And they broke your heart. And you're trying to pick up the pieces, and you are disappointed. And you may have just received a diagnosis or an illness in the prime of your life, and you are sorely disappointed. You may have had trouble having children. Maybe you didn't get into college that you want. Maybe some doors slam in your face, and you are disappointed. See, in these moments, we ask questions in depth and in frequency that we usually do not in other seasons of life because we are trying to figure out why. What is going on? But Jesus says that there is promise and providence in disappointment. And it's only in Jesus that we learn, especially in these seasons, what life truly means. Because Jesus flips a script, and he writes a new story. You see, Jesus gives us perspective on these moments of disappointment, heartache, and suffering in our lives. The, the message translation of where this story, this story called The Walk to Emmaus, it's taken from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter. And uh, there's a verse here that I, I think really stood out to me. It says, don't you see? Don't you see that these things, they had to happen? These things had to happen. That the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter his glory. You see, suffering in the Christian experience is something used by God for our good. It is not something without meaning. It is not something that just happens. But it can be used by God for our good and for his glory. 
the Apostle Paul unpacks this for us. And I'm really good with congregational participation, just so you all know. Okay, I'm really good with that. So there's going to be some scripture on the screen, and we're going to read it together. It's taken from the book of Romans, chapter 5, and let's, we're going to read it together. Even if you're not ready. I usually say things like, y'all ready? And then nobody says anything. It's awkward. It's awkward. We're just going to go. Okay, here we go. We can rejoice, too, in these trials and difficulties because God is at work in them. That doesn't mean we like them. Doesn't mean we go searching for them. But it does mean that God is in them. It is a step-by-step -step transformational process that God leads us through, that from this suffering we may endure, and through that endurance we may have the character of Christ enable our hearts to persevere. And through that perseverance we can see that God has a great hope for us, not just for tomorrow, but for today. And how do we know? How do we know that that hope does not disappoint because he loves us. God loves us. God loves us. He is with us. He showed himself at Christmas when he came down to be born as one of us. He showed himself on Calvary as he died and took our place and, and, and rose again for us. Jesus is with us. If you've been around Hope for any length of time, you have heard us say that we believe that discipleship, which is a big word that just means following Jesus, okay? Discipleship is the process of conforming to the image of Christ. Do you know what that means? It means you look like Jesus. Not just the seminarians, not just the staff people, not just the leaders, you. You look like Jesus. In the things that you say and in the ways that you act, in how you go through suffering and disappointment, you can look like Jesus. And you know what people do when they see Jesus? They say, who's that? Why does she act like that? How is she getting through this? Where does he find that, the strength? I don't, I don't know. If I was going through it, I, I don't know what I would do. So you begin to look like Jesus. And Jesus becomes the center of your life. Jesus becomes your hero. Jesus is the hero of your story. It's not you. It's not a parent. It's not a teacher. It's not a mentor. It's Jesus. Jesus becomes the thing that we can talk about. Jesus becomes the person who changed our lives. Jesus becomes the way that we can get through those disappointments. When somebody says, how, how are you doing this? You can say, Jesus. Because it doesn't just stop with us, right? Our faith's just not about us, right? Right, because you've heard us say, because we say it quite a bit around here, that the process of discipleship is the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. It's for the sake of others. It's for those other people who are facing a valley right now that you may have walked through. They need to meet Jesus. And God's plan is for you to bring about an introduction. If Jesus has changed your life, if Jesus has given you hope, 
if Jesus has made your eyes clear, if Jesus has freed you from sin and from worry and from all the things that we could see and say, now what? This is the takeaway from today. Our disappointments, I'm sorry, Mark, I jumped ahead. Our disappointments are others' opportunities to meet Jesus. Our disappointments are others' opportunities to meet Jesus. Why don't we say that together? Our disappointments are others' opportunities to meet Jesus. This is all part of God's plan. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. If you have seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus, this light is in you. This light, this great treasure is in you. And if you've had Jesus come into your life and change your life and become your hero and set you free from a disappointment, from a difficulty, from a struggle in your life, then you have a story to tell. May we be ready to say how Jesus has flipped the script. I got a picture to show you guys. I'm driving Mark crazy. So um, that guy on the right, man. But the guy on the left, uh, that's my brother. That's my brother, Michael. And uh, the story that I started with today was the story of his birth. And those were my parents. And they were 27 and 30 years old. Jesus flipped the script. He flipped the script on Mike's life. See, because I believe that uh, this world's a better place because Michael is in it. He's 35 years old, and he's experienced, and so have my parents, deep, deep difficulty. But people see God in him. And I know his laugh because the tears just run down his face. And I know the compassion that he has for those who are hurting as he gently embraces them and hugs them. And I know the smile on his face. But you can't really see it much. You see, because only the sides of his mouth really can go up. But when you see those go up, you know that Mike is just smiling from ear to ear. And if I'm honest, there's times that I just want to have kind of a regular conversation with my brother, whatever that even means. But Jesus flipped the script for Michael and for the rest of our family. And I am not the man that I would be today without him. So God is putting opportunities in front of you. God is putting people in front of you who may have experienced some of what you've gone through. And this series that we've been talking about, it's really not a series about people like Nicodemus who ask lots of questions and being there to answer them. It's really not a series about broken relationships and how Jesus fixes them. It's not even, this talk today is really not even about disappointment and how we get through it. It's about what comes next. It's about what comes next. Because if Jesus has done a good work in you, and if he has truly saved you, there's a world that needs to hear that. 
There is a world that is desperate to know the kind of love that you have experienced. And it is God's plan that you would share it. And so we need to be people who are listening well. People who are listening for people who are saying, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. People who are saying, I wasn't prepared for this moment. And people who are bold enough and courageous enough to say, well, can I tell you a little bit what happened to me? Can I share with you the hero of my story? His name is Jesus. Let's all stand together. Let's sing.